I'm Michael Abadi, and welcome to State of the State 2016. This is epi episode seven, and I'm honored and thrilled to welcome Bill Lee to the studio and to Montpelier and Thank the you. show. And um, Bill Lee is running for governor under the Liberty Union uh, Party ticket, and um, he was, he's an, I gotta say, iconic. Um, uh, baseball player with the Red Sox and the Expos um, career went from 69 to 82. Two. Uh, 73 All-Star. Helped win that AL pennant in 75. And since then, has been playing ball right through. He's been uh, baseball goodwill ambassador to Cuba. Um, you mentioned China, Moscow. I mean, China in 75. Moscow in 88, Soviet Union. And you've played, you played in Venezuela as well? Played in Venezuela for two years. And, and also, um, you gained some uh, union experience as an MLB player. You were a player rep. Yes, I'm responsible for more millionaires than anybody in the state of Vermont by taking the money from the billionaires and dividing it up amongst all the players because they're all making a million now. Right, and we, we can talk about labor more, but you've got that experience. And then um, it's a, about 25 years you've been in Craftsbury as farming. Yes, I've been the worst farmer in the history of Craftsbury. <laughs> uh, all my turkeys got eaten, uh, baby turkeys, by a fisher cat while I was on a road trip. And my ex-wife was there, and uh, I had a a trap out there and it got caught. One of its uh, paws got caught and it gnawed off two of its uh, talons to escape and oh. she didn't get a shot at it. So uh, I was out of the turkey business and then the sheep, uh, they got ill and uh, had ducks, and porcupines and everything were all, I mean at the porcupines, mostly the raccoons got after the ducks. And, and then my last chicken, I remember seeing it dying, a pile of feathers and it lost in the third round. <laughs> and it was a barb rock, meanest the hen that David Reed, my farmer, he loved that. He'd come up on his tractor and that, that barb rock and attack him. And, uh, you know, you don't need a handgun in the Northeast Kingdom. You just need a couple of barb rocks and two gray geese. Uh -huh. And they'll protect your whole house. Now, <laughs> how, did, how, did you, um, how did you find that spot? I had uh, come down that road after writing the book in 84, The Wrong Stuff. I rode it up in Abercorn, Madsonville on the Quebec side in a, a little chalet. And then I'd come to uh, get pizza, and I'd come into, uh, got all the way to uh, Newport, and then came up 14 one time, and I saw this uh, guy hang with a scythe. It was Robert Anderson. He had the biggest farm in Craftsbury, and the next farm was the Reed Farm. And uh, went by it, saw Craftsbury, fell in love with it. And about two years later, the fantasy camp came to me. John Savage from the Chittenden Bank here and Stuart Savage, Adele Savage, they came to New Brunswick, asked me if I would come back, uh, come back to Vermont and help them with the fantasy camp. Hmm. And they said, we'll put you up in, the, in uh, the Dimmick's house in East Hardwick when, uh, when he went to Florida. And I had all these re Red Sox relationships here. And uh, Ken Squires, his father, had a cabin up in Middlesex Notch, stayed there in the fall, and that was the fall when we had uh, the 16-inch snowfall on the 12th of October, okay. you know, which said, Welcome right to Vermont. Right and uh, <laughs> I learned that Middlesex Notch is pretty high up. Yeah. <laughs> and I learned that, and then uh, I came back, and then Scott Reed's barn collapsed, and he had to sell his cows. He was dairyman of the whole Northeast Kingdom, the best, lowest leukocyte level. And he comes there, and he introduces himself to me and says, I've, My father's selling parcels. Would you like to come live with us? And I went up there and I shook hands and uh, he sold me his 14 acres on the top and that was where I've been living ever since. Nice. And uh, David's still alive. He, he fought on Iwo Jima. He's one of the last surviving uh, Marines of Iwo Jima. Now you did service yourself. I read somewhere you Six were the years. last... Yeah. Last Red Sox that was drafted, I think, or some sense. I was the last Red Sox that was almost drafted. Okay. I was... I was smart. I passed my AFES physical in Oakland and immediately got on a plane, told the Red Sox, and they flew me on the red eye, and I enlisted in the Army Reserve at the Boston Army Base. Okay. And that kept me, precluded me from having to go to Vietnam. Right, and this was But the Army got Vietnam. mad. Yeah, they were going to send me to Nam anyway, and then I uh, basically, uh, 
I pitched well enough that if you throw well, you know, I was worth more with the Red Sox than I was walking point up and, uh, you know, up on the DMZ. Mm -hmm. But I was lucky. A lot of my Red Sox players did go to Nam, Bill Campbell, and stuff, and I and I was cursed by having to process all the dead bodies from New England. So I worked the MTS computer. Oh, that was your gig. That Jeez. was my punishment, and uh, wasn't it was it was tough work. Wow. You know, and I have to say, you can come get whatever's left of your son oh and an oak goodness. leaf cluster and a bronze star. Sure. And I was... Uh, That'll give you a sense of the consequences of war like nothing else. Exactly. Right? And I became... I was a long-haired hippie. Uh, I got busted back to uh, PFC before I even got out because... But, uh, you know, I was in uh, the head. I straightened out all the... Uh, all the papers and uh, publications in Mayaguez, Puerto Rico when I was stationed at the... Uh, the uh, base in Mayaguez, Puerto Rico, which is a U.S. protectorate. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and then I was chemical rail, uh, radiation biological warfare officer for the 1173rd. And, uh, you know, then I had to do atropine injections and nerve gas. And huh. it was uh, tough. It was, I did six years, but all the time I got to pitch, too. Which allowed me to it was pitch. Reserve time, right? And uh, they would schedule my weekends around times when I was. I'm actually responsible for annual training. I changed it from summer camp, which the Army used to do, and we called it annual training because I made my my living in the summer, so I did all my military work in the winter. Okay. And uh, So you could shift it I could season. shift it around. Right, and right, I, right. You know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and I was pretty smart, and the Army agreed with me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it affects change. Yeah, and I just, I'd go to the rifle range. I'd bring all the brass and ammo back, and, you know, I was a... Uh, I was pretty proficient in uh, the military. I was soldier of the cycle at Fort Polk, Louisiana, in fact. I was the, the number one uh, to come out of there and uh, the only one not to go to Vietnam. And in fact, they gave me a test and I passed it. And they wanted me to go to Fort Huachuca, become a second Louis, and immediately I would have been in the uh, NSA. So I could have been Snowden, too. Huh. <laughs> National Security Administration. National Security Administration. Uh, yeah. Let's talk, get back to, uh, you know, life and growth and farming and um, your 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 time as a farmer. Have you, has given you any insights into how the, the state can help out farmers? Yes. I uh, believe in Alan Chadwick and the uh, Indonesian hexagonal double digging technique for planting and allowing your soil to be better organic. You have less runoff. You have more, more soil conservation. And I believe Pete's Greens is using a lot of that. Not so much row planting that, that they do nowadays. Uh, you know, I think they were ahead of their time as far as providing food at a smaller like Vermont has not lot large pastures and stuff, mm -hmm. but Just we are hills, we are a right? lot like Vietnam. We are a lot like the Highlands. We're wet, we're damp, and uh, but we have the seasons, and we can grow everything we want: bok choy, melons. We can grow. It's this is the perfect place, Vermont. And uh, I've always been uh, an organic farmer, and. Uh, you know, I don't spray my apples. Uh, I take them the way they come, and uh, I press the juice. We have presses up there, and one day uh, a month, uh, Bill Pierce allows people to use his press. And we're all kind of in this group together, and it's that's what I love about the Northeast Kingdom, and mm -hmm. I think all of Vermont should adapt the kingdom philosophy. Nice. Now, you see the state, I don't know, providing incentives to farmers to move more in in that direction. I do know that um, there have been farmers terracing for rice. You mentioned Vietnam. Then we're actually, as we get warmer and wetter, it seems to be the. It's going to be the norm. Yeah. You know, uh, I have a southern exposure on the other 42 acres uh, that my wine partner. I make wine in California. I make a Petite Syrah, Syrah Cabernet, a Cote de Rhone blend. And if you take Vermont and you go right through, it goes right same place in southern France. Mm -hmm. So eventually. But they have the way the the currents are and stuff. I do not believe. I think we'll always have these extreme temperature swings here. Sure. You know, and you're Vermont gonna get that polar blast because that yeah. tongue and the way the shape of the Rocky Mountains are, it comes. It's called an Alberta Clipper, uh -huh. and it flows through. But I believe if you have a southern exposure, protect your grapes and 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 plant them properly, and shelter them a little bit. You know, and maybe you can shelter them with solar panels behind there, so you're collecting the southern light. Have your wine terraced, 
you know, we could have a viable uh, grape culture right here. Sure. Too. Yeah. And you're there's getting, a lot more. You're of it talking about season extension too, and really getting. I believe there's going to be a season extension. Our falls have all gone longer. Our winters are less harsh. Uh, you know, and uh, we do not get that uh, 15 days in '88 that we got where it's 40 below. I haven't seen that yeah. since I've been here. Right. Right. Our that could have been the last bit. gasp of real winter. As the polar ice caps melt, I mean, hell, there's tourist ships going all the way around Point Barrow, all the way through the yeah, they're uh, becoming shipping the North now, uh, huh? West Territories yeah. and stuff. So it's a, it's a shipping line. Yeah. I propose to the Canadian government that they do away with the uh, the lock system and the Great Lake system and uh, and uh, go right out of Churchill Falls and run all your produce and everything there, run it through Hudson Bay. And uh, it's a shorter distance to Europe. Huh. I thought that would be economically viable. And then for energy, for us, I've always proposed to the, the premiers, I've known all of them in New Brunswick for the last 25, 30 years, that why don't we harness the, the Bay of Fundy tidal bore with the 45-foot tides in the spring and the fall? I mean, there is so much energy to be made that way with a transmission line instead of running all this freaking lignite and this heavy uh, fuel oil that blew up in Lake Magantic. That was a terrible tragedy, and that was so close to us in Craftsbury, uh -huh. you know, when uh, that blew up. And that was going to the Irving factory over there in St. John, I'm pretty sure. That was and maybe a couple of years ago? Or? You won't believe how many transport trucks from New Hampshire and everything cross Vermont and go into the port of Montreal and get their uh, fuel oil and everything at a lower price because of the dollar up there, and then transport it back across the state line in Vermont. We're just uh, through. And look at all the logging trucks, Quebec logging trucks on 91 and 89 and on 12 and 14 and everything that are taking our premium beautiful logs and taking them to the shampoo and milling them up there. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to get more sustainable milling. We could, add, we could add the value here is what you're saying. and that's Exactly add the value here. Yeah. Do it on a smaller operation. Do it... Uh, you know, with these beautiful new wood misers, these beautiful little saws, you know, and a lot of people are doing that and do more customized sawing within the area for for our needs and right. readapt. So that, that's a model where it's not drawing in that one big industry that's going to provide us, you know, 800 jobs and another That dog don't it's hunt anymore. It's, it's sort of a small entrepreneurial economy. That's what we're going to be. We're going to be that. The Vermont brand is golden. When you put Vermont on something, you can slap a 10% more on it mm -hmm. just because it's, they say it's from Vermont. They know it's good. They know it's clean. It means and quality, right? So we've got to do that and maintain that, you know, that, that market by cleaning up our waterways, cleaning up our streams, uh, getting rid of the big cow farms, you know, going down, using more of their land on their farms for more organic farming right. and uh, be more diversified. So that, that seems to be the trick of it. How do you help them convert? We're know? going to have to help them convert. We're going to find a way because it's all about market. If they can make more money yeah, it's with less cows, yeah. we got to show them that a 2,000 cow farm ain't cutting it. You're dumping your milk anyway because Wisconsin's setting the price of milk. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys over there in Wisconsin with these cheese heads on playing for the Packers. You know, those guys are telling us what the price they're of cheese is going to be. Yeah, they're scaled up in a way we can't. Yeah, they're make scaled it. up because they're big. They they got subsidies. Those giant farms in Iowa and stuff. You know, they don't stay in right. Iowa in the winter. So we're looking at really as I mean, we're kind of we're getting there. We're out maybe are we a sort of a specialty ag market that serves. So we live near massive population centers yeah. too. We can get our goods to a lot of people. If this was the United States, right? We're that little word right there. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's it. We're number 49. Yeah, 630,000 people. In education, we're good. And, and uh, the quality of life, we're good. Everything, yeah, we're good. Yeah. We're not Alabama, <clears throat> Louisiana, or Mississippi. Right. So um, you're leading me to ask, as we are a small state, we, our population did near double when the interstates were um, put in. And I'm wondering, are you someone who sees that we really ought to work on inc increasing the population here, or are we going to see climate refugees from the coast? I mean, are you? 
I see them coming. Are you seeing a, uh, I don't know, we're like who, how, how many decades out, but. Um, I thought they'd be here a long time ago, uh -huh. and nothing happened, nothing happened. But I see the change right now, uh -huh. and I see it because finally people are realizing that when the Army Corps of Engineers put six inches on the jetties all around Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, and they did it 20 years ago, they knew something was happening. Sure. So I think that finally with that flood in Louisiana, the temperature down there, my daughter says, is unbearable. Right. Now, as far as, think how warm it is up here. And do that on steroids. People south of yeah, us. and uh, never get a break from it. Right? They never get a break. I think there's going to be more people moving north. I think that's the future. Yeah. But I guess with air conditioning, there was this huge southern migration, but yeah, that. That. that that was because they go down in the winter. I mean, mm -hmm. your your people up in North Troy and stuff, and your big farmers, they, they've got their places down in Fort Myers. They're all Red Sox fans. <laughs> I know, I know all of them down there, and they they all get down and the, they go down and they sit down there and complain that there's nothing to do. <laughs> I know one farmer that was up here, and his wife begged him to go to Florida. He did not want to go to Florida. He said, "Okay, we retire." He goes to Florida. He was dead within a year. Don't go to Florida. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> Especially if you're a hard-working farmer right. and stuff, because there is really nothing to do down there. So retire here. Retire a lovely here. Lovely quality of life. A snowshoe. Yeah. Get a beagle. Yeah. Go out and follow some, you know, hares around, and at least keep your cardiovascular up. Stay in shape. David Reed's 92, and he's still kicking. So most of you old curmudgeon farmers. Don't go to Florida to trap, <laughs> unless you're playing ball, and I still play. There you go, and then you're getting your exercise. And we won the Vermont State Championship. Uh, Middle Weinberger, mm. my catcher. That was your last visit to Montpelier, right? Last you cl closed out. Last the... visit. I threw 12 innings. I got a one-out double in the 12th, and he drove me in. Winning run. Ended the senior year, se senior league season, right? Is that right here, right here at your rec field down there at uh, Robin Roberts Field where he was uh, 18 and si 6 in the A-League back in the old days, and one of the great pitchers that I knew in my life. Hmm. So complete game, 12 inning, 140 pitch, 40 pitch victory. Congrats. Yeah, and Bill Mack, poor guy, struck out 22 of us, but when he woke up in the morning, the Times Argus had a big L right next to him. Complete us. game loss, 12 <laughs> inning. Yeah. Um, we're talking retirement. How about um, pre-retirement? People have a working life. You've got some experience as a, as, a, as, a, as a union rep. Um, the state's made some movement on a minimum wage talk about sick leave. What would you like All to see it. move forward? You got a number on minimum wage? Where would you see that? Like 15, 15, 15, just like, a, you know, and, uh, you know, be diversified. You know, uh, if, you, if you need extra work, go out because I'm going to raise the price on the Bud Light cans for the return. They're going to go up from 5 to 10 cents because... You can make more money picking up Bud Light cans in the spring after the skidoo trails go down. I can tell you a place in the Northeast Kingdom where you can make $200 in an <laughs> afternoon. They are the ones you always see. <laughs> They're the ones you always see. Yeah. That and McDonald's. McDonald's is going to get taxed more. Uh -huh. uh, white flour, uh, cigarettes, alcohol. I think, I think Germany sources trash and charges would charge the equivalent of the McDonald's for like, okay, 20% of the trash on the roadside is McDonald's. We're going to, and it's not really a tax. It's like, yeah, you're yeah, going to take I'm, care of what you put out into the world. That's that quarter German of me. It's mm -hmm. in our DNA. We <laughs> think that way. You know, you know, the Germans, I said when uh, a long time ago, everybody should drive a Mercedes or a BMW because they're the most best en engineered cars in uh -huh. the world. And my father says, you come home with a Jap car or a German car, I'll shoot you. He <laughs> fought on Okinawa and, and Tinian. Yeah. You know, and he had the, the Silver Star with the Oak Leaf clusters, and uh, he was tough. You know, and that's our relatives. I'm the first, I'm the baby boomer born in 46. Right. I'm the that. responsible, we were the worst generation. They were the best generation, we were the worst generation. <laughs> We were worse because they fed us on time. They put us on the potty on time, and we were all regular, and we all I was bubbly, fat, and uh, I'm just the same as I was when I was 18 months old. So you you had sort of a classic 50s upbringing. And, Boy, and, didn't and, I! I was leave it to Beaver. Found your found your way. I was Wally. I was Los Angeles. Mom smoked cigarettes. Had uh -huh. the meal on the table. Yeah. You know, I am the classic <laughs> Hollywood kid.
Yeah. North Hollywood. Well, the boom's got the boomers got plenty to be proud of. I do believe that. Um, I don't. I don't. <laughs> every time I look okay. in the mirror, I, I see what a squanderer I am. Of, of you know, I, I was bought into this thing. This World War One was unnecessary. That was a bunch of in-laws fighting mm. amongst themselves for the control of some donut shop in Berlin, mm -hmm. Ich bin ein Berliner. And if World War I was not right, then Hitler would have never came about, so we wouldn't have had World War II. And if we don't have World War II, we don't have the Cold War. If we don't have the Cold War, we don't have Korea, we don't have Vietnam, what would the planet be like if we were a peaceful race? Yeah, and all those resources were spent to exactly. yeah, growth, right? Maybe we would all be like Canadians, you know? Well. The nicest people on the earth. Married, last two wives are Canadian. <laughs> there, um, you actually got to experience their healthcare system. I did as an expo, but I didn't take advantage of it. I paid. Oh, you okay. Know? But I would get an X-ray of my arm, and I go in, and I didn't have their insurance benefits. But I would go in. Actually, I didn't pay. The expos paid. But after I retired, I still go back. I get oh. all, all my implants. So I'm not in past tense. Actually, present tense. In present tense. I get all my implants at half price. I get my shoulder surgery. I got the big zipper here for my rotator cuff, Larry Coughlin, for $5,000. It would have been fifty, seventy-five thousand. So what here. are what are they doing? Yeah, right I got that... morphine drip every six minutes. It was pretty <laughs> great. What are they doing right? What can we learn from the Canadians? What can we actually? They actually tax their here? people properly, and they get it back, and they have all these sin taxes on food and everything, and all that goes mm -hmm. to their medical and stuff. And uh, people are healthy. People are happy. People go out at night, and they actually walk around the streets downtown until two thirty, but three o'clock in the morning, there, huh? and they socialize, and then they go home and wake up at twelve o'clock, and they don't want uh, they don't watch Sunday night football because. The CFL is on Thursday and Friday. <laughs> they reserve their weekends. They reserve their weekends for themselves and their families, and they're not, they're not all committed to uh, NFL. Well, it seems like with trying to roll out Singer Payer in Vermont, it was that point. You actually led with the unpopular thing to say they tax their people properly, and that seems to be where Shumlin walked it back. He did not think it was politically viable to sell a payroll tax at, well, I don't know where it was, 7 9%. And you got to pay for it. How do you pitch it? How do you pitch it? You got. It's got to get. You through. get what you pay for. If you want security and you want to wake up and you want to like your job and you want to go to the job and know that if you fall down or something, you are going to be taken care of. That's a good way to live your life. Go north to Canada. They're happy. They're happy. Go to Switzerland. They're happy. Go to Norway. They're happy. Go to Sweden. They're happy. Their workforce is happy. Our workforce isn't happy. You know, because of a bunch of Republicans with a bunch of short arms and long, deep pockets, they look like Tyrannosaurus Rexes, and they go, they go like this all day. We're not going to do it. We're not going to pay for it. You got to pay for it, or eventually there's going to be a revolution. And you're seeing it with Bernie Sanders. You're seeing it with the Black Lives Matter. And eventually these people are going to get upset, and they're going to take back their country. And you two percent are going to have to go to. Norway or north of Norway because that money's it doesn't trickle down. Reagan was wrong, you know, Thomas Malthus was wrong, John Kenneth Galbraith was wrong, all of it's bait. Well, Kenneth Galbraith was a Canadian, he was actually all right. He's the only economist <laughs> I ever really read that I enjoyed. And his son's not that bad, except he got into the oil patch, and that's why Sue Minter's running against him. <laughs> um, Thank you. That was a lot. Um, <laughs> so, in terms of uh, this this state now, um, you mentioned. I, I guess what you just said. I think a, a segment of the population found this sort of kind of wake up call. Some people heard that as scary, and some people heard that as hopeful. Do you know what I mean? I know. If you're educated, it's hopeful. If you're uneducated, it's scary, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, oh, my God, they're going to take away and they're going to all of a sudden these Muslims and everybody are going to come into my trailer park and shoot us up. That ain't going to happen in Vermont. Trust me, it ain't mm -hmm. going to happen. You invite people of other faiths, of other religions. That's the key to life is get to know different people and embrace that. There'll be no radicalism in this state. This state, you know. It's a, it's a great estate, and it'll be fine. So yeah. I'm not worried about There's that. There's a bedrock stability here, huh? I think so. I think we came here. Everybody here 
and the reason uh, they came here was to get away from the madness. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we can't survive here, where the hell are we going to go from here? Now, um, you speaking on Canadian health care and learning from Canada, um, they also have a multi-party system. And um, you, are, and balances. you are creating a multi-party governor's race just by throwing your hat, yeah. literal hat, into yeah. the ring. And I just, I, did you, were you paying attention to how that multi-party system works up there? And oh, yes. It's, well, I was part of the, the I guess what's party. the benefit of, of that? You get more what, voices. How are we lacking? You get more voices. You get more uh, discourse. You don't get this, this controlled by the super media, Fox, CNN, and everything else. They distort it. It's wrong. Read Amy Goodwin. Read the books that are out there that have the truth. Rumsfeld in 1983 was Saddam Hussein's buddy buddy. They nerve gassed the Kurds. They the gave him money area. like that. And he goes, no, that wasn't me. And then all of a sudden they showed him a picture of him shaking hands. He goes, where did you get that picture? Oh, yeah, that does look a lot like me. Yeah. Rumsfeld, liar. Republican, liar. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing how the... Iraq war continues into 2016 to be a, a central campaign issue. I mean, that is just, it's, it's this it's multi-decade it mess. Is. I knew it the day it happened. The day I was with uh, Ken Burns. I went to Ken Burns' house in uh, Walpole and saw the second, uh, the second tower collapse with Ken Burns in Walpole. And I said, this will go on forever. This is exactly how the crusade started mm. and how we got our ass kicked by Saladin a long, long time ago. And you just cannot defeat monotheistic behavior like that. You've got to be polytheistic. We Vermonters, we worship trees, we worship river, we worship quail, we worship pheasants. That's kind we of Abenaki crops. right there. Huh? We're Abenaki. Yeah, that's you know? nice. And you have to have that mentality. Everything is alive. But when you start practicing an Abraham and everything else, everything is dead, you know. And what do you want? Do you want things alive or do you want things dead, you know? And I'm not going back and you know, sitting with Father Crow, hail and brimstone and me, saying you're going to hell. Because hell is uh, Mississippi when it's 99 <laughs> degrees and 90% humidity. <laughs> you're, uh, you're, yeah, you're speaking nicely on that. I guess how spirituality informs informs your politics. It did, um, and that might... I'm very spiritual. I'm very Zen Buddhist. I'm very flexible. I do my yoga every day. I have full range of motion. I concentrate on being able to pitch every Sunday and going 12 innings, and I'm going to do that till the day I die. Excellent. Maybe the governor's race will get in its way, but. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you guys are all set, you know, especially half the people in Vermont have already voted because they're leaving for Florida. That's right. Election Day <laughs> itself doesn't matter so much anymore. It's funny how October is kind of harvest season in baseball where things get yeah. serious, farming and politics. So yeah. here yeah. we are. I imagine you'll be, are you going to do much traveling around the state? I know you're not soliciting campaign funds. None. You're not playing that game. None. Are you going to do a I have to be consistent around? with my values. Mm -hmm. And my values are you shouldn't have to pay for a government. You shouldn't have to pay people to, uh, to, to get them out there and stuff. It's uh, one man, one vote, you know. We only have three votes in the, you know, for presidency anyway. The state right, right. we're very low electoral We're power. very low. Yeah, so yeah. they used to say, as Maine goes, so goes the nation. And then they said, as Maine goes, so goes Vermont. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's because of FDR, wasn't it? Um, thanks for uh, ex expanding the uh, playing field and uh, putting your hat into the ring and yeah. getting getting all these uh, I ideas want I want there. the conservative vote because I am more conservative you know than any Republican out there and I am a gun toter I go out when I carry a gun I see no grouse when I carry a baseball bat birds fly all around me <laughs> so I carry a baseball bat because I don't really want to shoot them and eat them anymore <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have time. I thank you so much for getting here and uh, enjoy campaign season. Yeah, this is, uh, this is as good as it gets here, right here. This is a, uh, you know, I've already won in Montpelier. I would like to win again because I think I'll do the best job for you because uh, I'm the only guy that'll have his hands in his own pockets. You are, yeah, you're on a winning streak, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. All right. Take care now. Thanks thank for getting there. Thank you very much.